Okay. Well, we can begin. My name is Matt Holland. I'm the program and volunteer coordinator at the Buffalo History Museum. Uh, welcome to our program tonight. Vindicated, a fugitive is welcomed home after 86 years, the Tulsa Race Massacre, a survivor story with Dr. Barbara Steele's Nevergold. Uh, just a little bit of a ground rules. Uh, we, we're gonna do a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, um, you can use the chat function, but we, we prefer if you use the Q&A, it's just easier to keep track of. Um, and there will be a recording of this available later on. So if you know anybody who couldn't make it, or had technical difficulties, uh, it'll be available on YouTube later. So uh, no worries uh, if, if somebody misses it. Um, and I'll share that with everybody who's registered, but we'll also just share it through the museum's social media um, functions. And then also I will say um, last night, um, Dr. Bertram's, uh, we had some technical difficulties with her program. It didn't happen overnight, the Tulsa Race Massacre, um, and we will be airing that at a later date. Uh, so stay tuned to that. If you are registered for it, we'll be sure to contact you. Um, and also uh, just, just uh, reach out on our social media. So that will happen again. And that's part one of this two part series on the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, but now I'd like to introduce Dr. Dr. Barbara Seals Nevergold, um, who will be giving the presentation tonight. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, so Bar Barbara Seals Nevergold is a lifelong educator who taught in the Buffalo schools, the University of Buffalo and SUNY Empire State College. In 1989, she co-founded the Uncrowned Queens Institute, Institute and has worked to create a model for the reclamation, preservation, and dissemination of the biographic histories of African-American women and men. Dr. Nevergold is co-author of the book series, Uncrowned Queens, African-American Women, Community Builders of Western New York and Oklahoma, and numerous other publications. And she's also a board member at the Buffalo History Museum. So let's welcome Dr. Barbara Seals Nevergold. And uh, I hope you all enjoy. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, I'm setting up here. here we go. Oh, welcome everyone. A um, hundred years ago on this date, the Greenwood District of Tulsa was in smoldering ruins. Hundreds of African-Americans were dead and thousands were homeless. So would you please join me for a moment of silence in remembrance of this American tragedy? Thank you. Um, I want to thank the Buffalo History Museum and especially Matt Holland, whose help has been invaluable for hosting this webinar. Their support has been an example of how organizations can partner in the community to bring about programs that have outreach to a diverse audience and promote the rich history our community is fortunate to share. Now, Almost 14 years ago, my colleague, the co-founder of the Uncrowned Queens Institute, Dr. Peggy Brooks Bertram, and I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma in December 2007 in the midst of the worst ice storm that state had experienced up to that time. 2007 was the centennial year of Oklahoma statehood, and Peggy and I had applied and been accepted as the only out-of-state organization to have a centennial project. The Uncrowned Queens of Oklahoma took us across the state from Oklahoma City to Enid to Altus to Tulsa and back again, produced a book and extended a website technopedia. It also took us across time, connecting us in a more personal way than our academic studies had to Oklahoma's African-American history. But this time we were coming to recognize an uncrowned king of Oklahoma and to make a little history ourselves regarding an individual I've come to feel a connection to 
even though I never knew him during his lifetime. Now, right here, I'll ask you to put a pen in it, and I'll continue this story in a few minutes. Uh, so the Uncrowned King that I'm talking about is Andrew Jackson Smitherman. Now, a contemporary once referred to him as a pen warrior because Smitherman believed that journalists had the responsibility to use the power of the press in fighting for the rights of African-Americans and other marginalized people of color. What he said was, we, the newspapermen, must be pen warriors in the liberation of black people from all their chains, real and imaginary. Printed words are powerful weapons. Smitherman was a fearless voice in that fight. He not only talked the talk, but he walked the walk. He was a graduate of the University of Kansas, but he was not a journalism major. He began his job at Muskogee Seminar as an office manager and law clerk to W.H. Twine, who was the editor and publisher. Now, as Twine's law practice required more time and he gained confidence in A.J., Smitherman became more involved in the journalism side of the paper. His talent and innovation became apparent early. By 1910, he was elected the vice president of the Western Negro Press Association. And a year later, he was elected the president of that organization and served until 1921, of course, when the race massacre occurred. Citing his decision to become a Democrat while Twine was a staunch Republican as one reason that he ventured out on his own, Smitherman started the Muscogee Star in 1912. That was the predecessor of the Tulsa Star, which he began in 1913 as the first black paper in Tulsa. And later he launched the Tulsa Star Daily, the first and only black daily in the nation at that time. Smitherman used his papers to advocate for enfranchisement, to oppose lynching and Jim Crow laws, and also to express his long held belief that blacks had the moral and legal right as well as duty to protect themselves and others from mob lawlessness that included uh, the mobist if they were black. His newspaper models changed slightly over the years, but the message was consistent to be an outspoken uh, supporter of justice and equality. As early as September 1911, he reported that the black community of Bryan was, quote, no longer depending on the law to protect them, but will protect themselves. Further, he wrote that our people should obey the law and see that criminals are brought to justice, oppose mob law in all its forms and fight to the bitter end for the protection of home and family and die if need be in the defense of right. Brother Gordon says, fight like hell. And we say, amen. In 1914, Smitherman reported on a lynching in Eufaula. Eufaula, I think. He expressed his outrage and challenged black men, including himself, by saying, Negro men, it's up to us to act. We must have justice. Our wives and children are not safe in a country so rent with outlawry. Let us respect the law and enforce it at the point of guns. When a Negro is charged with crime, let us aid the officers in apprehending him and take our guns and protect him against mob violence. Four years later, when he received news of a threatened lynching and a brewing race war involving armed white and black men, Smitherman rushed to Bristol, 35 miles from Tulsa, where he found the properties of blacks had been destroyed. The lynching was averted but Smitherman was threatened by a mob of whites, including the mayor. He refused their demands and finally was allowed to leave, but he reported the situation to the governor who ordered an investigation and ultimately arrested and charged 38 whites, including the mayor. Smitherman received many letters of commendation from his readers. His mentor, W.H. Twine wrote, go on my boy, you are on the right track. Smitherman was a proponent of reparations as well and encouraged residents in Bristol who lost property to contact him 
so he could seek restitution for their losses. An active life that included social and civic activism, what Peggy and I like to call community building, was changed inexorably by the carnage on May 31st and June 1st, 1921. Smitherman lost his home and his newspaper valued at $40,000 and his community. Smitherman's actions that night are documented up to the first trip to the courthouse to protect Dick Rowland. His epic poem, The Tulsa Race Riot and Massacre, offers nothing short of an eyewitness account of the black defenders' actions against the mob, many of whom were indiscriminately deputized and given weapons and greatly outnumbered the black people. Here's a snapshot from um, several verses of that poem. Stand back, men, there'll be no lynching, black men cried and not in fun. Bang, 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 three quick shots followed and the battle had begun. In the fuselage that followed, four white lynchers kissed the dust. Many more fell badly wounded, victims of their hellish lust. Quick they fled in all directions, panic-stricken, filled with fear, leaving their intended victim as the news spread far and near. Now, I don't know how many of you saw the president today in Tulsa, but he actually quoted uh, uh, stanzas from this poem, not these, uh, and, and he spoke of Mr. Smitherman uh, briefly in his remarks, um, and it was, that was quite gratifying to hear. When it was over, the majority of those arrested and charged with inciting the riot were black men. It just took the grand jury five days to return an indictment, which they did on June 6th. And they had already, of course, come to a decision. So it's no wonder that Smitherman didn't think he'd get a fair trial because their decision was to exonerate all the whites, just a few of whom had been arrested. Walter White, the assistant secretary of the NAACP was sent to Tulsa to investigate the massacre. He met Smitherman in St. Louis he may have suggested that Smitherman would be safer in a northern eastern city like Boston. Also, Smitherman's friend and ally, Monroe Trotter, editor of the Boston Guardian and an original founder of the Niagara Movement lived in the city. By Christmas, Smitherman wrote White to tell him he was ready to come out of hiding and of his plans to lecture and have family perform his poem. He created this brochure to advertise. This part of the poem illustrates the personal toll on women and children resulting from the terrorism unleashed that night. Smitherman told White that his decision was, quote, the only manly course open to me. I owe it to the brave fellows who fought and died for a great cause on May 31st and June 1st. And I owe it to the race. Now I'm not going to I recite this poem. I'll just let you all read it for yourselves. Moreland's story, the NAACP's first president, helped AJ to get an article on the race massacre published in the Boston Herald. He was paid $20. He asked Story for additional help in securing newspaper, a newspaper job or getting articles published without success. However, the day before Smitherman's article was published, Richard Lloyd Jones fired off this telegram on January 14th, no doubt referring to the article and any future one Smitherman might write. Smitherman wrote White the next day saying, I guess the fight is on. He was also, however, alarmed that his Boston address had been used in the publication, which is not a normal practice. In response to Story's concern, White gave his assessment of Smitherman's situation, saying he believed that Smitherman was in danger of being prosecuted by extradition warrants and would not be safe if he was returned to Oklahoma. The article, Will Tulsa Riot Horrors Awaken America's Indifferent Attitude? Of course, today we hear the expression, 
that words matter. Of course, it's a new iteration of an old idea. Smitherman branded May 31st and June 1st as the Tulsa race riot and massacre. From the beginning, he had no indecision about how he would refer to the deadliest event of racial violence in this country. It was always a massacre, even if he used the term riot in this title. He masterfully capitalized on articles and editorials in the Tulsa world and other white newspapers to make the case for white complicity in the massacre. He commended the initial responses of shock, remorse, and compassion for the victims by quoting the Tulsa world, which decried maltreatment of, quote, women and children, black and color to be sure, but guilty of no other offense. The paper argued that, quote, these people have a right to life, to the pursuit of happiness, and their earthly possessions, unquote. In addition, the papers called on citizens to be reasonable, to avoid, additional, to avoid additional violence by making the case that continuing threats to the black community could be a self-inflicted wound and that white self-interest was a practical response because they, quote, the black people, are essential to our economic and industrial life. You cannot drive 10,000 citizens from any community without impairing the commercial and business life of that community, unquote. Still, within a very short time, the sentiment changed. And in what Smitherman called propaganda, the papers began a classic blame the victim. I'm sorry, hold on a minute. Blame the victim strategy to cover up diminishing accountability on the part of the white community. And as Smitherman wrote, to quote, shift the responsibility for the riot and massacre to our people. Smitherman's history of seeking reparations dates back at least to 1918 and the Bristol incident. It's also important to remember that Smitherman was speaking about people he knew and loved his family, friends, and neighbors who were traumatized and made homeless by the white mob. He was speaking for personal, from personal experience. Again, he supported his argument by citing the Tulsa world, which immediately after the, the massacre called for Greenwood to be, quote, made whole for restitution for all the losses. Yet the, the paper quickly went silent on the subject. It's incredible, yet not surprising, that Smitherman wrote about a fight that continues to this day. Only a couple weeks ago, several survivors over the age of 100, the last three surviving survivors, addressed Congress about reparations for Tulsa. And Tulsa, of course, is not alone. There are numerous other examples of racially related massacres whose victims are also waiting to be made whole. At the end of this article, Smitherman drew a compelling picture of the deadly and unjust nature of the attack on Greenwood. In his article, he described, quote, one-sided battles with waves of machine guns firing and the cannonading sounds of explosives dropped from airplanes amid the heart-rending cries of suffering women and children. He called for the passage of the dire anti-lynching bill as paramount to address incidents of lawlessness and racial violence. And as he argued, would finally make the 14th Amendment effective. The bill never passed, opposed by Southern Democrats. Smitherman observed, quote, surely justice sleeps while injustice runs amok. And in the end, the Tulsa race massacre fell victim to not only indifference, but active subjugation. How long Smitherman struggled to get lectures and dates for new opportunities to share his story in writing is unknown. He moved his family to Springfield, Massachusetts and started another newspaper he called The New World. 
However, no copies appear to have survived. Smitherman's move to Buffalo was the beginning of a new life and a new paper. This is just a snapshot of the almost four decades long period of community engagement, significant accomplishments and contributions during the last years of his life in Buffalo. There were challenges too, like keeping the newspaper going. He filed for bankruptcy on at least two occasions, but managed to keep the Empire Star going until 1961. In 1960, he began to write his autobiography. However, sadly, he was stricken at his desk as he was writing and died before reaching the period of the race massacre. But his Buffalo sojourn is a story for another day. Like the majority of people in this country, I was ignorant of the history of the Tulsa race massacre. So what motivated me to get involved researching the history of A.J. Smitherman? Eddie Faye Gates was a major influence. She was a founding member of the Tulsa Race Riot Commission, the name of the commission in, formed in 1996 and was changed to the Race Massacre Commission in 2018. Uh, Eddie Fay was the chair of the committee to document the stories of the survivors and had completed many oral histories um, by the time we met her. In 2003, the Uncrowned Queens Institute invited Mrs. Gates to be a keynote speaker of the Institute's third national conference. During that time, she one mentioned that Andrew Smitherman had come to Buffalo after Tulsa, but she couldn't tell me much more about him, although I, I believe she had interviewed his daughter, Carol. Second, I've lived in Buffalo much of my life and grew up not far from the offices of the Empire Star. And I was a high school junior when Mr. Smitherman died, but I had not heard of him or his newspaper. My interest and curiosity were piqued and I, I had to learn more about the survivor of such an horrendous episode in our history. As I researched his life, including his early life, I recognized a man who was committed to his people, a man of considerable intelligence, integrity, strength, and resilience. He was, in my opinion, a phoenix. He, represent, he represents the unknown and unheralded people in our community whose stories are vital in shaping African-American and American history. Now, if I can just backtrack a minute to the Uncrowned Queens to say a word about the Institute. It's an organization dedicated to preserving African-American regional history and sharing that history on our webpage, which we call Uncrowned Community Builders. Since our inception in 1999, our mission is to identify and document the lives of women and men who are not well known, unknown, or in danger of having their histories lost. Peggy Bertram and I have dedicated over 20 years to excavating that history, uncovering, sometimes to our surprise, extraordinary stories of Black people. During my research on Mr. Smithman, I learned that one of his compatriots, J.B. Stratford, had been pardoned in 1996. And the journal and idea was born. I thought, why not advocate to pardon Mr. Smithman too? By that time, I had written an article, the first of several, to be published on the life of A.J. Smitherman. And Peggy and I were beginning to make personal visits to Oklahoma for the Uncrowned Queen Centennial Project. I sent emails and made calls to a number of Tulsa officials, including the governor's office, and was finally directed to the DA of Tulsa County, Tim Harris, who suggested I put my ideas or my request in writing. In May 2007, I sent a letter to Mr. Harris. Several months later, I received word that Mr. Harris did indeed agree that it was time to clear the record of Mr. Smitherman, as well as 54 other black men, including Mr. Smitherman's brother, John, who'd been indicted with him. The Greenwood Cultural Center was built to memorialize the Greenwood community and was a fitting site for the expungement proceedings. As I noticed, noted earlier that Dr. Brooks Bertram and I made the trip and found ourselves in the worst ice storm in Oklahoma history. All the municipal buildings were closed due to power outages. 
except the Greenwood Center. That made the occasion even more meaningful. The welcoming party included the Honorable Mayor of Tulsa, Kathy Taylor, a representative of the County Executive, State Supreme Court Justice Vicki Miles LaGrange, a state representative, race massacres, survivors, and community members. Presiding Justice Jesse Harris also presided at the Stratford expungement. The commitment of this group to attend the ceremony was even more impressive in that most of them admitted to having to get dressed in cold and dark in order to make it to the center. And speaking of his reason for his decision, Mr. Harris said, quote, it is my hope that dismissal of charges against all defendants will reaffirm our commitment to the rule of law and help to promote racial healing in our community. I believe it is important to recognize the atrocities and devastation that occurred during this shameful event. Judge Jesse Harris said in granting the DA's motion to dismiss that, quote, justice delayed in this instance is not justice denied. Justice at any time is an essential part of justice at all times. Many were nameless, but now we know the identities of 55 men, even if some of them only had nicknames like one chummy. After 86 years, this proceeding brought acknowledgement of a wrong and movement restorative toward restorative justice by setting the record straight. We don't know what became of them, but as a result of this action, I hope these men can rest in peace now that their records have been cleared and that they too were welcomed home. People ask me all the time how I feel about my record, my role in successfully advocating for these proceedings. I think you may have gotten an indication from some of the things I have said during this presentation. But let me say that I'm an educator and a lifelong learner. The day of the expungement, I made these comments. Quote, I followed and even joined in the reader response to the article in the Tulsa World about today's proceedings. A number of readers wrote that the ride was old news, that we should stop talking about it, forget about it, and just move on. In other words, they would have, have us relegated to a musty old history book and set it on a shelf somewhere. That view promotes the mistaken belief that the historical past has no relevance to our present or our future. Moreover, it ignores the significant fact that there are many survivors who live that history and continue to live with the impact of that history on their lives. I'm inspired by those who have gone on before, and I hope that our children will also be inspired. So I'm motivated to work to ensure that these stories don't stay in history books and that they are shared widely and understood for the lessons they teach. African-American journalists have been among the most influential civil rights activists and leaders of their times and of our times. Drusilla Dungy Houston, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells, Mary Ann Shad Carey, to name a few, were fearless voices for the rights of Black people and used their journalistic platforms to amplify those voices. They also did not hesitate to put themselves in dangerous situations when called upon. Andrew Jackson Smithman was resilient and never abandoned his commitment to advocate for equity and justice for the rights of Black people and was a member of that group. Buffalo residents remembered him when they wrote about his, and they spoke about his competence, his humility, and his humanity. Finally, let me just end on a relevant message from Mr. Smitherman that is 99 years old. In the wake of the Tulsa race massacre, he raised the question, would this incident awaken America's indifferent attitude? In fact, he also laid out a blueprint in response that has relevance to us today. And I'm going to paraphrase here a bit because first he talked about the acknowledgement, the importance and the, the fact that the wrong had to be acknowledged 
and acceptance of accountability for the harm inflicted on the victim. Second, that victims must be made whole and compensated for their losses. And third, that there must be a national response to the wrong and such as a law for remedy for any of the wrongs. He concluded his article, etc., by saying the following, quote, some 12 million citizens of America together with several millions of fair-minded, justice-loving white people of this country and foreign worlds and foreign worlds are by no means indifferent. They are looking on, waiting, watching, and praying for the awakening of the soul of America. And I thank you, Liz, and welcome. Any questions and comments at this time? Thank you, Dr. Nevergold. Uh, it looks like we've got two questions already here. Um, we have one person who's asking, what happened to Dick Rowland? Do you know that what happened? Uh, yes, uh, Sarah Page did not follow through filing any um, or filing any charges. She refused to file charges. Uh, Dick Rowland was released and left town. I'm not sure anybody knows what happened with him, but um, both of the parties in the uh, in in the incident that set off the, you know this whole massacre um, left Tulsa. And um, basically, I think we're anonymous the rest of their lives. Mm. And here's a second question. Um, what prompted A.J. Smitherman to move to Buffalo? Did he have any family here? Do you, do you know if there's anything in particular that prompted him to move? Uh, I'm not aware of that. I have not been able to um, learn that. I know that I've been talking with some family members recently. So I hope that I'll have an opportunity to, um, to learn that, but I'm not sure why he chose Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Those were the two that we have so far. Um, we could wait a minute, just to see, make sure. I know it takes time to type <laughs> into that Q and A session. Oh. oh, looks like we got another one. Let's see. So, um, uh, how much of the Greenwood community was taken from the black residents? You know? Oh, I see Mr. Mr. Smitherman's grandson is there, Mr. Dozier. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, well, it, in essence, almost all of it. Uh, it's certainly one of the things that happened afterward is that um, the uh, black residents tried to uh, file for insurance for um, fire insurance to uh, recompense them for their losses and the insurance companies denied that and then there were white residents real estate um, owners who are uh, realtors who tried to rezone the whole district so that they could make it easier for um, the, the real estate to be um, uh, confiscated essentially uh, from the owners so there were a number of really um, underhanded, nefarious plans that were um, that were in, uh, that were uh, started in order to uh, keep people from um, getting their land back. Uh, fortunately, the father of John Hope Franklin, historian Buck, uh, Buck Franklin, uh, was an attorney, and the attorneys, the black attorneys, got together and they went to court and they prevented um, some of these schemes from, um, again, essentially stealing the land from them. But the, the properties were burned out. There was some rebuilding, but it was never rebuilt uh, in the way in which it had been before the massacre. Hmm. Let's see, it looks like we got a couple others here. Let's, uh, do you know where um, Mr. Smitherman is buried? Yes, he's buried here in Buffalo, uh, in uh, Mount Calvary uh, uh, Catholic Cemetery in Chittawaga. Mm -hmm. So he is buried here in Buffalo. Yep. All right. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have.
But um, oh, let me see. So one person is asking um, in the attack of the um, uh, in Tulsa, they were using aircraft. Um, has there been any investigation into that or, um, or they were using aircraft to bomb? Do you know much about that aspect of it? Well, I certainly know that you know, at, at one time there was a denial that airplanes had ever been used. That's the, you know, it's somewhat like today. Um, people said, no, that didn't happen. But actually, yes, that did happen. And yes, there have been historians that have looked uh, into the use of airplanes to drop, um, I think they were turpentine bombs, uh, mm -hmm. turpentine bombs. Um, and and uh, so people have looked into to that. Other historians have written extensively uh, about the use of airplanes and um, it's documented that they actually were used to firebomb um, the, the residences. And that's why there were, the destruction was so horrendous because of course there were whites who were looting and who were burning the residences down. But the fact that there were fire bombs dropped on buildings from the air um, made the fires um, much more deadly and the destruction you know, much more complete. And if you've ever seen pictures of Tulsa after the massacre, you'll see that uh, you know, there were homes and, and buildings that were burned to the ground. And, and that happened because of the ways in which they were attacked in the use of the airplanes. Hmm. It looks like here, we've, we'll do one more. Um, is there any information why the, the white Tulsa newspapers went silent after first calling for treating the Greenwood residents humanely in the aftermath? Do you I'm know? Sorry, I missed you. Yeah, so there's here somebody asking, is there any information why the white Tulsa newspapers went silent after first calling for treating the Greenwood residents humanely in the aftermath? I don't know if they've got like uh, any additional information on that. Well, essentially, there was a whole the conspiracy of silence. Mm. It, and, and it wasn't just the papers, the, 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 purpose, the papers conformed, I think, to... Um, the authorities and the, the powers that be that ultimately uh, buried information about this massacre for many, many years. And so, um, you know, it, it, the papers were a part of the conspiracy and this is conspiracy of silence that took place. So uh, initially they told the truth and, and then they began to, to backtrack uh, because it wasn't profitable, it wasn't, uh, you know, it was interesting. There are many reasons, but no, they did not. I did see uh, a message from uh, Mr. Dozier, whose mother, uh, Carol Smitherman, was the oldest child of Mr. Smitherman. And um, I mentioned her being interviewed by Eddie Faye Gates. That's right. And Mr. Dozier, thank you so much for attending and any other family members. Uh, appreciate your supporting um, um, this presentation and for your comments as well and for uh, enlightening the, the other um, participants. Yep. All right, well, I think we're gonna, we're gonna end there. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nevergold. Uh, it's a very excellent presentation. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll be in touch with the first part of this, which is now the second part uh, from Dr. Brooks Bertram will set up another date to, um, to uh, have that talk. And, uh, and I'll be in contact with everybody who's registered for both this lecture and hers. So I'll notify you personally. And then also um, we'll have that on the, the Buffalo History Museum's social media. Um, so um, thanks everybody for tuning in and um, I hope you have a great evening. <laughs>